Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We're here with episode 2491, and I'm looking forward to going through a new food sensitivity case study. So this case study is a very typical one that we see inside of our practice every single day over at Equal Life. I wanted to share that with you, but I also wanted to share the new lab parameters. It's not wildly different, but I always like to give our integrative health practitioners an update and all practitioners in the industry, now, as well as show you basically how easy it is for anyone to read this right at home. So this is a lab test essentially for ages three years old and up. You cannot be too old uh, to run this lab. And it gives you so much great information on an IgG food sensitivity. So what that means is this. A lot of people kind of confused about what an IgA, what IgE, IgM, IgG means. Let's just talk about IgG today. So this is a very different lab test because all you have to do at home is a little finger prick. And then you take a few drops of blood just like you would for taking your glucose level in the morning or blood sugar. And you just put a dr couple drops on a card. You mail the card into the lab and you get back 190 different data points about how you react to certain foods. So this is, uh, again, an amazing test. The reason is, is that in IgG, food sensitivity is actually a delayed reaction. That means it's an immuno, it's immunoglobulin G, and that immunoglobulin does not typically react for 24 to 72 hours. So that means if you eat cranberries, let's say, uh, or whatever, and you don't eat those within the last day or so, you can still have a reaction two days later. So we share with people this, like, let's just say today, this is being released on Thursday. Okay, so I can ask you, do you know what you had Monday night for dinner? Do you know what you had Monday during the day for dinner? Do you know what you had Tuesday? So, and if you don't, when it comes to Thursday, it's really difficult to figure out why you might have the brain fog, joint pain, lethargy, overall fatigue, right? Uh, or skin rashes, autoimmune flare-ups, et cetera. And a lot of this, because again, when you have a food sensitivity, it does not mean anaphylaxis. So you're not having your throat close up on you. You're not breaking out into hives that right away after eating. Um, you're not getting a headache right away. That can come days later, but not right away. So that's why it's difficult. Those reactions I just spoke about are more IgA and IgE. Those are more immediate. So they're gonna happen within 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, a couple hours of eating. That is different. That's not what we're testing for because we believe in our practice. You don't need to spend money on that. You know what's affecting you when you eat it. If you eat shellfish and you start getting itchy skin, well, shellfish is a food sensitivity then for you. So again, it's a great lab test. We've helped so many people with digestive issues, skin rashes, autoimmune, et cetera, et cetera, right? Headaches, migraines. So what I wanna do is just share with you what this lab test looks like if you've never seen it before, but also how it's differing um, from the previous one, and again, it's very minor, it's very, it's just degrees, but I always wanna be there to update you. Okay, so here we go, 190 different biomarkers. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on the ones that are low. How you read this lab, just again, cursory overview. I'm not giving you all of the IHP material, but basically, if you're watching this on video, there's a green block right here. Then there's a lighter green lime block. There's a yellow block. And then there's a, let's call it tangerine, like orangey based block. Now, what it means is that when there is the black line, which is your sensitivity, and it's only in the green, so this is, if you're not watching this on video, Picture a horizontal line, and it goes from green to light green to yellow to orange, okay? And so your value, how sensitive you are, is represented by the black line. Now, since foods are foreign to the human body, there's gonna be some level of reactivity. It's quite small. And so if it's a small black line, and it does not extend past the first green block, there is considered a low sensitivity to that food, and that's totally normal. There's no issues with you eating that food. 
enjoy it unless it causes you, again, bloating or an immediate reaction because, again, we're only testing for IgG, a delayed response, okay? So this has nothing to do specifically with lectins or oxalates. If you know you have issues with those, that is not what this lab test tests for. It tests for, in the, pro it tests for the proteins in these foods. And yes, even carbohydrates or vegetables, fruit, they have proteins as well. So we're testing for the proteins in those specific foods, okay, the amino acids. Basically, all if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, you're taking a little bit of your blood and you're mixing it with the antigen of the food and you're looking for a reactivity, right? So you're looking at, does your blood, the immunoglobulins in your blood react with this food? And if so, how great is the reaction? That's really what we're looking at, right? So that's the science behind it. They use this at hospitals, children's hospitals all around the world. Uh, this is not new science. Uh, we just make it easy by working with labs that can get you, get you these results right at home and also the privacy of your own home. I don't believe anybody else needs to see your lab data. So when you run it through Equalife, all privacy. Again, people ask this all the time, so I'm just sharing it with you. It's private. It's kept between you, the lab that runs your results, which is a CLIA certified lab, the highest certification that you can get, uh, and Equalife. That's it. So you get those three, and our data does not go to anyone else. Doesn't go to your insurance, doesn't go to pharmaceutical, doesn't do anything like that. So I just want to, again, share that with you. Okay. So no real reactivity is the green block. Then as it moves to light green, small reactivity. As it moves to yellow, larger reactivity. That's considered a moderate reaction. And then the orange would be considered a high reaction. Okay, so let's get into it. So this individual, if we, and it's, everything is broken out by uh, sections. So the first section is dairy. Are you reacting to beta lactoglobulin? All right, so protein in milk. Are you reacting to casein? Are you reacting to cheddar cheese, cow's milk, goat's milk, mozzarella? sheep's yogurt, whey, or yogurt. Now, this individual is reacting to cow's milk. They're reacting to sheep's yogurt, whey, and your regular yogurt. Now, this is not typically what we see. That's why, again, we always recommend you should run your own because this is, you know, you never know what you're gonna see. Typically, we'll see casein elevated, we'll see cheddar cheese elevated, we'll see cow's milk elevated, but not as much with this individual, okay? So this individual has a moderate, uh, so it has a mild reaction to cow's milk, Sheep's yogurt, which we hardly ever see. Again, that's why it's great to run this. Um, almost nobody reacts to goat's milk, so that's why it's always a safer one to go with, uh, or goat's cheese. And then whey and yogurt. So they're reacting to all of these fermentable dairies as well. Interesting to see, right? So they don't do well with yogurt. So again, no matter who tells you that yogurt's good for you, they're gonna be wrong many, many times. Because again, unless you run a test to look at your bioindividuality, you have no idea. I have no idea, right? You don't have any idea unless we lab test. Okay, so really interesting stuff. Um, this person again. So what do we do? All right, so this is what we do. Mild reaction. We eliminate the food for six weeks, and then we reintroduce if the person wants to to see if there's any type of reactivity. So if they remove the food and their brain fog goes away, the joint pain goes away after a couple weeks, their uh, skin rashes, you name it, right? Um, and then they reintroduce the food, let's say once or twice, in six weeks from now, and it starts to creep back a little bit, okay, well then there's still a sensitivity. But typically what we do is um, mild reaction, remove for six weeks, moderate reaction, the yellow, remove for 12 weeks, and then if it's in the orange, six months, because it's a very large reaction. And um, those ones may or may not go away. It all depends on how healthy your gut is and if how you've done rebalancing it as well. All right, because we've seen like eggs that are off the chart, uh, we eliminate them for a good three to six months, repair the gut, add eggs back in. They seem to do all right for a lot of people. But anyway, it is the third, second or third most um, prevalent IgG food sensitivity. All right, so I'm not going to go through the whole lab for you, but this individual in the beans and peas section is sensitive to garbanzo beans. That's important because garbanzo beans, garbanzo beans make up hummus. All right, so if you've if you've eaten hummus before, it's coming from chickpeas, which are garbanzo beans. I don't know why I can't say that today, but <laughs> you know what I mean. All right, soybeans is elevated for this individual, mild. Now, here's an interesting one. So coconut is right on the line of very little sensitivity to mild sensitivity. This would be one that I eliminate for six weeks, but most likely this individual is going to have no problem adding that back in a couple times a week in six weeks from now. All right, as we move over to additional fruit, uh, really nothing, you know, pineapple, you can see it halfway in the in the green zone, but it's still fine. Again, it just means that it's a, 
larger normal reactions, but it's well within normal. When we go to grains, some people don't do well with grains but it does not have to do necessarily with an IgG food sensitivity. It may be lectin-based. It may be you know, overall digestion from the fiber because their gut's in balance, right? So that's why you know, if you eat, this person has very mild on amaranth, but if you eat amaranth and it causes you digestive issues, then again, that's a digestive sensitivity and that's a big difference from a food sensitivity. You know what, why don't I link that up today? The difference between digestive sensitivity and food sensitivities. So if my team can link that up at stephencabral.com forward slash 2491, that would be amazing. All right, and of course, this lab is completely redacted. We never share any client information. All right, so then we move over to uh, the rest of grains. Great fish and seafood. This person has no sensitivities at all to fish and seafood from an IgG perspective. Again, an IgA is a different story. If you eat fish and you get hives, I'm just letting you know that's an initial reaction, and it's good to look at both. All right, um, th this person's doing really well on eggs. And again, that, that's great to see. Now, here's one that, I, good, I was looking for one of these. Almonds is in the orange. So this person has a big sensitivity in almonds and almonds are super healthy for you, right? Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. In this individual's case, they are not healthy for them. Every time they eat almonds, they are causing a large inflammatory reaction from IgG. Super important to look at that. All right, mild reaction to cashews. So almonds will be taken out for six months. Cashews will be taken out for six weeks. All of the rest of them look totally fine. Uh, we'll move on to their vegetables. And again, you're getting, uh, there's a lot. There's at least a dozen of nuts and seeds they test for. Uh, vegetables, there's probably what? Two dozen or so that they test for. This person has just mild sensitivity to garlic, but not, I shouldn't even say mild. It has normal, but a little elevated sensitivity to garlic, but really no big deal here at all. All of that looks good. When we get to herbs and spices, there's no issues with herbs and spices. They test about 15 to 20 herbs and spices, everything from tarragon to thyme to black pepper, cilantro, you name it. So really, really beautiful lab on this. All right, bromelain, good. This was elevated too. I like to bring this up. We see bromelain quite elevated on a lot of these labs. And um, you know, I don't know what to make of that quite yet. Of course, we know that bromelain comes from the enzyme inside of a pineapple, uh, but it's also used in nutritional supplementation as well. And it does move into the, the bloodstream as a proteolytic enzyme to help break down um, necrotic tissue, pathogens, et cetera. It's also phenomenal for nasal passages, opening up uh, post-nasal drip, sinus issues, et cetera. So, you know, if the client really needs it, I will use it if it's beneficial, but if not, I will take it out, all right? So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and that's it, and then the rest of this lab test just gives you a nice little reactivity summary. So the high reactivity for this individual was almonds and bromelain, and the low reactivity was cashews, garbanzo beans, whey, coconut, sheep's yogurt, regular yogurt, which is cow's yogurt, by the way, cow's milk yogurt, cow's milk, and soy bean. So um, I just wanted to share that with you because it's a nice little summary. And I believe that is it, right? Oh, and this is what I wanted to show you. So now the new difference with this lab test is for the visual people, that's why I love, I mean, again, I love lab testing. For the visual people on this lab, green, light green, yellow, orange, you wanna be in the green, all right? Light green, mild. Yellow, moderate reaction. Orange, high reactivity, okay. And so here's what I wanna show you though. That's all a graph, no numbers. They used to do numbers and graph together. Now the big difference is they just broke out the numbers because they didn't wanna confuse people with all the numbers. So here's what they did. They're going through the same exact categories. Like it literally looks exactly the same, but now they're just showing you not significant, means like normal within the green, and it's a low reactivity if it's in the green yellow, right? That lighter green color. And it gives you the actual number to see how reactive you are. But the truth is, you can very easily see that just by looking at the graph. So for practitioners, have no fear. It's the same exact uh, graph, but now they separate the numbers out below for the people that are a little bit more analytical. Again, they even use the same colors. If you look at almonds, uh, you want to be less than a 1.84, and this person's almost a 10. So they're like almost a 10x where they should be. So obviously almonds are very sensitive for this individual. All right, the last thing is there were just some minor changes in the ranges, meaning like, and again, you don't really have to know this, but um, the ranges for what would be considered not significant, low, moderate, and um, significant are all, or high, are all 
uh, slightly changed. And again, this is no big deal to the practitioner because what you're gonna do is still base it on the category that it falls into. So why would a lab do that? Well, the truth is the more data you get, the more sensitive you can make your lab. So if this lab runs, let's say 10 million food sensitivities a year, well, after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they can get even more sensitive in what is normal and what is more reactive. And so I love that. Again, like that's how the industry should be. You shouldn't stay static. So um, again, even with our formulas, if we find a way to like tweak it a little bit or there's more research that says, hey, um, add 50 more milligrams of you know, time or 50 less milligrams of time, well, that's what we're gonna do. It still works. Again, this lab worked 10 years ago. It works today. But if you believe in real science and true science, well, then it's not static and you're gonna be able to tweak that as needed. All right, the last thing I wanted to share with you on this, and again, IHPs, any questions, just let us know, um, but they give you all the ranges right here, nicely broken out. So don't confuse your clients' IHPs. The best part is really these graphs. Green is good, light green, well, mild, yellow, moderate reactivity, orange, high reactivity. Now. And they give you one additional page, and they actually look for yeast and candied albicans as a reactivity to that. Um, it's not, diagnose, not diagnostic, but it can mean that you have elevated levels of candida, a yeast, a fungus inside of your body, and it's, so it is something to look for. Again, is it, is it um, diagnostic? No, but certainly clinically significant uh, for sure, meaning like don't uh, not pay attention to it. It does matter. Now, the good news is for this individual, pretty normal food sensitivity tests, maybe like you know six things or so that are, are sensitive, um, and, but really only one, almonds, that is, is quite significant, that's gonna cause quite a bit of inflammation. All right, so candida elbic, and again, that's super important because if this person was drinking almond milk every day and they were eating almonds you know, four or five times a week, well, they're creating quite a bit of inflammation in the body, and then that's gonna end up as whatever you're genetically predisposed to or more um, at risk for the brain fog, the skin rashes, the migraines, the headaches, the joint pain, the lethargy, the low mood, et cetera, right? So again, it all affects us a little bit differently based on our um, genome, based on our, our SNPs, actually. Okay, so this person shows, again, it's still green, light green, yellow, and then orange for the bars. And this person is in the green on both yeast and candida albicans. So again, no clinical significance there in terms of elevated levels. We like that. So if we match that up with their candida metabolic and vitamins test, and they're low on candida or yeast and fungus on both, very safe to say that this individual um, is not dealing with a yeast and fungal-based issue. So um, hopefully this was helpful. I'm always happy to answer questions. I love being able to do case studies for you. So hopefully this was helpful. Of course, if it was, do feel free to share this with anyone you believe it can serve. And IHPs, we will put this inside of your level two uh, food sensitivity module for continuing ed. Take care, everybody. Have an amazing day. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp parts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources.